my goodness, I am so thankful for everybody here. I am so thankful for all of the kids who sang today. So thank you for waking up and thank you for getting dressed and thank you for driving the people who brought you here. I'm glad you did that. I'm also very thankful for all the adults who helped wake children up and put clothes on and wrangle them here to church. So thank you for that. And I'm really thankful for all of our volunteers, our Sunday school teachers who've been committed, uh, and the many people who helped our music education program for today to happen. I am so grateful. I never imagined how meaningful it would be to have our children come and sing with us. Who would have thought two years ago it would be so meaningful to have children singing in worship. I've been thinking a lot about how meaningful it is for the kids to be here. I've been thinking about that all week. Because believe it or not, this is the time of year when pastors in our denomination, when you're clergy, we have to like fill out all this paperwork. There are a bunch of forms and reports that we have to fill out. And on one of those forms this week, when I was filling out my self-evaluation, it asked the question, what has brought you joy this year in your church? And I'm going to tell you, I knew the answer immediately. It was being back in worship with people for the sacraments. Sacraments being communion and baptism, that's right. For me, it's been incredibly meaningful to be back in person and live and on demand. It's important that we worship together, but it's also important to come together and actually experience those symbols of grace together. There was another question on that form, and it said, what has been frustrating for you at church this year? And I don't mind to tell you, I knew the answer to that question really fast, too. You may know what's been frustrating for you. For me, I said, not knowing how to plan. That's been frustrating. Usually, in the church world, there are indicators or there are predictors that we have that can kind of help us plan. And it's been very hard and very frustrating not to have those same indicators and predictors in place. So it's been hard to predict tomorrow. But I'm thinking that that's not just a church problem. That's been a problem everywhere. And really, you shouldn't pay attention to human predictions anyway, to be honest. I mean, who would have predicted that halfway through the season when the Braves lost some of their best players that they would win the World Series. Who predicted that? Who predicted a lot of the outcome of last night's football games? I did not. And I'm not gonna talk about which ones I'm upset about, you should know. (laughs) We can't predict those things. And who would have predicted that having children sing at the beginning of worship would have been as meaningful as it was this morning. And who in the world would have predicted 2020? Actually, there's a woman in this church. She comes to chapel, and she's an elementary school teacher. And in March 2020, I know for a fact, in March 2020, as her elementary students were gathering their belongings at school, she said, don't worry. I predict we'll be all back together in no more than two weeks. Human predictions. Here's another one. In 1943, the CEO of IBM said that he believed there was a world market for five computers. Just five. In 1949, there's a magazine, you may know it, it's called Popular Mechanics. And in 1949, they made a prediction about computers too. And they were so excited to announce that one day a computer would only have 1,000 vacuum tubes and only weigh 1.5 tons. Can you imagine putting that in your backpack? You think your backpack's heavy now. 
Real quick in your mind, I want you to count how many televisions are in your house. Go ahead, take a minute. It's going to take you a minute. Count how many televisions do you have? I hear some of you counting out loud, yeah. There was a person, an inventor, and he thought that technically, yes, televisions are possible, but financially they're absolutely infeasible, that no one would ever be able to afford a television. You don't have one? I'm sorry. <laughs> oh. It's true. He felt like there's no way anybody could afford a television. Another human prediction, there was a recording studio, and a band came to play for them. They wanted to be picked up by the label. And when they heard the performance, when they finished, the recording studio said, we predict that no one is ever going to like your sound. And we predict that guitar music is on its way out. This was in 1962. Do you know who I'm talking about? There was a recording company that said, guitar music is on the way out. No one will ever listen to you. Do you know who they turned down? The Beatles. Yeah. You shouldn't rely on human predictions, huh? We actually have some divine predictions that have been made in there in Scripture. And the first one I want to talk about is in Mark. As he came out of the temple, one of his disciples said to him, Look, teacher, what large stones and what large buildings. And then Jesus asked him, Do you see these great buildings? Not one stone will be left here upon another. All will be thrown down. That's the prediction that Jesus made. And here's the rest of the conversation. When he was sitting on the Mount of Olives opposite the temple, Peter, James, John, and Andrew asked him privately, tell us, when will this be? And what will be the sign that all these things are about to be accomplished? Then Jesus began to say to them, beware that no one leads you astray. Many will come in my name and say, I am he, and they will lead many astray. When you hear of wars and rumors of wars, do not be alarmed. This must take place, but the need is still to come. For nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. There will be earthquakes in various places. There will be famine. But this is but the beginning of birth pangs. Jesus and the disciples left the temple and they went opposite the temple. And Jesus looked upon it and said, all of that will be no more. And the disciples who heard this could not imagine what that meant. Just in case you don't remember your temple knowledge, we're talking about an incredible temple in Jerusalem. It's this huge wall area with this immediate empty space in the middle so everybody can congregate and gather in the middle. You're talking about parts of the wailing wall in the temple of Jerusalem. And if you remember, which I know you do, the smallest stone of the temple weighed about three tons. The average stone of the temple wall weighed 50 tons, one stone. Technically, there is absolutely no American sports complex or likewise that could even rival this huge temple in Jerusalem. And now Jesus is staring at every one of those stones from the opposite side saying, this will be no more. And the disciples say, but it's so gorgeous, but why? What will the sign be? And Jesus says, this will be no more. Stone by stone will go away because of what has been done within it. To give a little bit of context, you have to read a little bit ahead of this scripture. And if you do that, you'll read that in Mark, Mark is the gospel that has Jesus coming in a donkey. He's coming into the city on this donkey and everybody's saying, Hosanna in the highest. This is the scripture passage that we read for Palm Sunday. Mark has Jesus coming into Jerusalem into the t and going straight into the temple. 
And when Jesus goes to the temple, he looks around and he pays attention to the people inside of it. And the next time he goes into the temple, Mark has him cleansing the temple. You remember? Mark's version of this story is that Jesus says, you have turned my house of prayer into a house of robbery. And Jesus gets rid of the thieves and the robbers. And the next time Jesus goes into the temple, he's challenged. He gets in these arguments with the scribes and with the chief priest and the elders of the church. And he's challenged. Who are you anyway? What is the greatest commandment? What do you know? And Jesus walks away from church frustrated. And in the coming and going back and forth from the temple, you may remember that Jesus actually passes a fig tree and the fig tree is bearing no fruit. And so then after Jesus passes by, it withers. That is a foreshadowing of what will happen with the temple because of what Jesus finds inside the temple. It is bearing no fruit and so it withers. And the prediction of that destruction comes in such a vivid and dramatic form of earthquakes and famine and war and false leaders. And because of the language that's used, it's called a little apocalypse. Now, when people hear the word apocalypse, they kind of freak out. They're like, oh God, do not be worried. This is called apocalyptic literature. Apocalyptic literature, some of these exact phrases that are in Mark, They're in the Old Testament in the book of Daniel, and they're in the New Testament in the last book called Revelation. And so right here inside of the middle of the gospel, in the middle of the good news, we have apocalyptic literature. And apocalyptic literature simply means this. It's dramatic imagery and vivid language to describe what God is doing in a historical event. Dramatic language, vivid imagery to describe what God is doing in a historical event. And so we're told through this prediction that while something may be destroyed, only what will happen is the pangs of birth. In the midst of something that may hurt, will come, using God's influence and God's grace and God's love, will come something new from it. And that's the good news of the text. That no matter what destruction we may be feeling personally or as a church or in culture is our worldview, what we may be feeling could just be the pain of something new and good, something of a new worldview or a new sense of church or a new sense of love or a new sense of identity and a new sense of equality and a new sense of culture. Emily Towns, she's the dean of Vanderbilt Divinity School. She was not there when I was there, but I've always read her, her work. And she writes a lot about this particular text because she says, people who are living in enslavement, be it physical or spiritual, people who are living in enslavement need to know that the birth pangs of freedom are coming. And so she says it's our job as people of faith, it's our job as people of deep faith to pay attention and be on the edge of the temple. She says it's our job to be on the edge of the temple so that we can hear the cry looking for something new. It's our job to be on the edge of the temple so we can hear the outpourings of the world saying, I need something else. And it's our job to be on the edge of the temple 
so that we can see the obstacles that we have put in people's paths, preventing them from experiencing the whole love and grace and forgiveness and identity in Christ. To say it a different way, we, of people of faith, it is our job to make sure we feel the pain of destruction so that we may be the ones to usher in a new way of life on earth as it is in heaven. I was working with a pastor in Virginia and he and I were moving at the same time. I was going on to a different church and he was going on to become a district superintendent and our offices were right next to each other. And so I'm packing up all my boxes and he's packing up all his boxes. And he hollered out at me, Marion, come here, I got something for you. So I walked over and he handed me a book. And he said, if every, if ever in your ministry, somebody tells you what to plan for, I want you to hand them this book. And on the book, it said, why the world will end in 1984. <laughs> yeah, obviously that did not happen. And he said, the purpose is don't ever live under the pressure of tomorrow. Respond to what God asks you to do today and you'll already be ready. Do not live under the pressure of a human prediction for tomorrow. Respond to God's call today and you'll already be prepared. I have to tell you, church family, you've been doing this for a while. You've already been doing this. When I first got here, it was about three years ago. And I don't remember if I reached out to this missionary or if the missionary reached out to me or the global mission team. I don't remember how it happened, but I remember very vividly the conversation within a month of my very first day here. The missionary's names are Sharon and Graham Nichols. And they're in Ecuador. And she said, Marion, I have a problem. She said, we're about to be at the beginning of a school year. And the problem is, is that children here cannot go to school unless they have a very specific pair of shoes. Does this make sense? Do you get new shoes when you go to school, anybody? Anybody get new shoes? No? Okay. Well, if you ever, do you ever get new shoes, maybe? Yeah. The issue in Ecuador was these poor children could not go to school unless they had a very specific pair of shoes. And she said, Marion, if we can't get children's shoes, they can't go to school. And you know what happens? If an 11-year-old cannot go to school because his parents cannot afford those pair of shoes, that student has to sit out for the year. And that, what happens if the student can't afford the shoes the next year? They have to sit out another year. And by the time the family does save enough money for these pair of shoes, that 14-year-old has to go back to school where the student left off with all the other 11-year-olds. And that may not feel so great. And she said, is there any way the church can help us buy some of these official shoes so that all of the children that we work with can actually go to school. And I said, well, how much are the pair of shoes? <laughs> they were $10. And I said, okay, how many children are you working with? 300. I said, so you are asking for 300 pairs of shoes at the cost of $10 each. She said, yeah, and I'm really sorry, but I'm going to kind of need it today because today's the last day that we can buy the shoes and they can go to school. Do you know that in your name, I was able to say yes? Because you had already responded to what God had called you to do. I was able to say, yes, this church family will make sure 300 students go to school tomorrow. As soon as 
school ended in 2020. I don't know if you noticed, but school free lunches ended. <laughs> Lunch ended and restaurants began to close and food supply was difficult and stores became difficult to go buy what you needed. And guess what happened immediately? The nonprofits and food pantries closed and this church remained open. And somehow we were able to use this building downstairs in the fellowship hall. We opened up the doors and it took a great deal of patience and safety, but we had families volunteer one family at a time in a very safe way. And we began to put food in people's cars, in their trunks. And all of a sudden, this church was prepared. And from March 2020 to the end of July 2021, we together gave out 250 families every single week. Got cooked meat, fresh dairy, fresh produce, and groceries. For over a year, you gave out food to 250 families a week. Multiply that by four people living in a house. You did that. As soon as people were quarantined and churches began to shut down, this church did not miss a worship service. This church never missed a worship service because we had the technology and we had the staff to make sure that we went online immediately. And in fact, we had already been live streaming because of you. And so when other preachers were trying to figure out how to video themselves doing selfies during their messages, and while people were trying to figure out how to play music at the same time, our church was doing it. And they were turning around and our staff was saying to other staff and other churches, how can we help you with best practices? How can we help you do this? Our hospitality crew downstairs, they never missed a beat of making hot meals that were delivered to people in our church that needed food. Our children's department immediately went into evolving and becoming a different way to do VBS and a different way to reach out. Immediately, our youth group began to do things and outside, they began to check on their youth do you know that within two weeks, our staff called every single person on the rolls of this church to check on them? If you did not receive a phone call from the staff, that means we don't have a good number for you. So please see me, see Matt, because we want to get your phone number because literally we checked on everyone that we had a number for. It was incredible. All of those things we were able to do because you responded to what God was asking you to do that day. In November of 2019, no one could have predicted the need that we would have, but we were prepared for it because you responded. There's a woman in this church in Chapel Roswell. Her name is Lauren. And in the fall of 2019, in November, she came up to me. It was right after worship one day. And she said, Marion, I think we need to plant a garden. And I was like, whoa, whoa, that's a new idea. Do you know that is not, whoa, that's too new for us. And she's like, no, I'm serious. We need to plant a garden. And she said, I'm committed to this. I know what I'm doing. I feel like God needs me to plant a garden here. And I said, Lauren, you don't understand. This is a new idea. This is church. This is going to take a minute. <laughs> and she's like, no. We need to plant a garden. And I finally just said, okay, let's plant a garden. That was in November of 2019. If you know anything about our giving garden now, it has completely changed the landscape of our campus and the landscape of our ministry because it was that garden that produced 1,600 pounds of food to be given out to our community when no one could eat. It was that garden that produced 
120 gallons of greens. And you've eaten it. If you've eaten during that pandemic year downstairs, you've probably had some of our greens in your salad. Our giving garden became a place of growth and it became a place of fruitfulness and it became a place of respite when people needed to leave in their own houses and go outside and help. Our garden did that. And it was able to do that because someone responded to the call on their life that day, not based on what they thought we would need. Chapel Roswell, I know you get frustrated with church. I know that. And I know you get frustrated with the leaders and the scribes. And I know that sometimes you want to challenge it and be challenged. That's normal. And I know there's some times when we feel like we want an earthquake or something huge, something dramatic and something vivid to happen just so we can feel something. I know you get frustrated, but I also know that we are still the body of Christ, still called to do the work of Christ, and we do it with joy, and we do it in complete faith that how we respond today is what we will need tomorrow to serve our neighbor. And so I firmly believe, Chapel Roswell, that we are sitting on the edge of the temple. And we are the ones through conversation and through in-person worship and through observing the sacraments and to celebrating our kids. We are that community of faith that is poised and ready to show the world what a community of faith can look like next. Amen. It's hard to give. I know it's hard to give, and I know that every dollar matters. There's a great story about a little girl and a mom. And the mom was trying to teach her how to be responsible financially. And so the mom gave the the little girl a dollar bill and a quarter and took her to church. And she said, I want you to decide what you're going to give. So they were at church, and they sang, and they had a good time. And then they went back, and when they got in the car, the mom said, okay, tell me, which one did you give, the quarter or the dollar? And the little girl said, well, I was going to give the dollar, but then the preacher said the Lord likes a cheerful giver, so I just gave the quarter. (laughs) I know it's hard to give, and it's hard to to give away. But everything that we give to God, we're called to do it. And we're called to do it cheerfully as a faithful giver. And now is our opportunity this year to do that. The campaign is called The Next Step. And there are pledge cards right next to these baskets. And what I'm going to invite you to do today is our response during our last hymn. I just invite you to pay attention to what God's asking you to do today and do it. If that's a monetary donation, if that's a monetary pledge, write that on that card. And if you feel like that's something else, then write that too. And I invite you to make a commitment to this campus and to this Chapel Roswell Faith of Community. Make that commitment today as a part of your relationship and a part of your worship. And you can take that card, you can take your commitment, and during the last song, while we stand, you can go find one of those baskets and put it in there. But now I invite you into a time of prayer as our response now. And as we prepare to pray, I want to tell you a few celebrations. We've had two births in our midst this past week. And without telling you the names and too much, I want you to know that both babies are healthy and both moms are doing great. We've also had two weddings this past weekend um, in Chapel Roswell. So congratulations to Sarah, one of our youth workers, and also to Rachel and Warren. And Rachel and Warren actually uh, came home to get married, but they are part of our virtual campus from Texas. So 
we celebrate in the midst. And we also celebrate that there's so many of us here. So if you came with a friend, if you came to celebrate anyone under um, four feet tall, we are so thankful to have you here too. Let's pray. Gracious and holy Lord, we are full of gratitude today with all of the many things that you have been doing in our lives. May we continue to prepare for what's unknown. May we find ways that we can respond to you. May we find ways that we can respond to you in faith with careful intention. Lord, we ask that you use us. Use us so that someone who doesn't have a home of peace or of safety can find in us one. And may you help us be poised and ready to act. And may we be poised and ready to listen and to serve. And may our minds be open to receive whatever it is you put it in front of us. God, there's so many times when maybe we have hurt someone with our opinions or with our words or with our actions this week. And for all of it, we say we're sorry. But we also want you to know that we're ready to try again. And so put into our path new ways that we can try again, that we can have a different conversation, that we can be quick to forgive, or that we can um, rely more on our humility rather than our ego. Put those times in our path. And Lord, for the work that we have ahead of us, for the school days that we have ahead of us, for the many errands and chores that we think of that are in front of us. May we have a constant sense of your presence as we do it. May us, may we all be advocates for grace and for love and your equality. Amen.